We've got a special guest in the race room today. We've got Christian Silt, the editor of Formula Money and a contributor to almost every single newspaper there is that you can buy on the business of F1. Christian, welcome to the race room and to Paul Position. Good to see you. Now, at the moment, there is a huge trial going on in the world of motorsport and more importantly, F1. And mm -hmm. for those of you who watch the channel and perhaps aren't quite au fait with F1, Christian, perhaps you could explain who Bernie Eccleston is because he is at the centre of this trial. Sure. Well, um, Bernie Eccleston is uh, 84, well, he turns 84 this year, year old billionaire who effectively set up the modern Formula One as we know it. Um, really, he's the commercial boss of the sport, but uh, he signed all of the deals that have made F1 as successful as it is today. And um, really, he is still pretty much all, all important and all powerful in Formula One. He signs still all of the, uh, the key deals in the sport, whether it's circuits, TV stations, sponsorship deals. He is um, the He's often really uh, referred to as Formula One's impresario, the uh, the top man for sure. And yeah, he's in uh, a spot of bother, putting it mildly. He's in court in Germany in a, um, a criminal trial where he's been accused of uh, paying uh, with his family trust a, a $44 million bribe to steer Formula One uh, to a seller, uh, to a buyer of um, uh, of his choosing. Basically, the uh, the company that currently owns it is a uh, an investment fund called CV. They bought it in 2006 from a German bank and uh, Bernie has been accused of uh, steering really the sport to, uh, to this company CVC because it was going to keep him in his position as uh, the boss of Formula One. And um, so he now finds himself in a German court uh, defending these uh, charges of bribery. And what are the chances of him being found guilty of these charges of bribery? Um, I think it's very uh, early days. The trial has only really only started at the end of last month, so it's difficult to say at this stage. Um, the problem that Bernie has is that he's admitted paying the money, um, the 44 million. He says that the, uh, the banker who received the money um, was effectively blackmailing him um, and was threatening to reveal uh, unfounded um, details of his uh, tax affairs, so false allegations of his tax affairs and, and was effectively blackmailing Bernie and that's why the money was paid. Um, now the, the court in Germany says the opposite, they say it was a bribe to, uh, to steer F1 to his preferred bidder. Um, so I mean I think you know there are arguments in favour of both uh, uh, both sides, really. The the prosecutors, uh, in a rather uh, intricate manoeuvre, have accepted uh, the key parts of Eccleston's uh, defence. They've said that um, there was an ori originally there was an agreement uh, where the banker would sell F1 to his preferred bidder, um, and then to actually extract the money from uh, from Bernie, the banker blackmailed him um, and threatened to make these false allegations about his tax affairs. So the the prosecutors have sort of built Bernie's defence into their case, which on the one hand uh, for uh, for Bernie he makes it difficult because evidence that he produces, uh, say, was blackmailed, uh, the prosecutors can then say, well, we know and we accept that. But the flip side of the coin is that the prosecutors have effectively accepted uh, his, uh, his defence argument already. So if he can prove and demonstrate that he could, he could not have paid and did not pay a, agree to pay a bribe, then he should be in the clear. He says that he wouldn't be able to run it anymore. Who do you think would be in the running to take over a role that Bernie Eccleston hmm. has previously filled and who yeah. would want to? And he's been doing that for 40 years. I mean, basically, so it's, uh, it's difficult, uh, virtually impossible really for one person to, to fill those shoes. I mean, in addition to signing all of the deals, you know, Bernie, because he's been in the sport for such a long time, he, he knows the ins and outs of the contracts really closer than any other person. He, uh, he knows all of the people, the key business people, on a personal level and in some respects he acts as a, like a guarantor. There, there are many companies and individuals that are involved with Formula One simply because they trust that Bernie will um, you know, run the sport effectively and that they'll get a return. So I think it'd be very difficult for an individual to replace him. There's been talk about Christian Horner who's the boss of Red Bull Racing uh, currently or last year's champions in F1. 
Um, I, I, I've spoken to Bernie about that, and he doesn't. He, he says that's that's not accurate. Um, there's been talk of the former boss of Sainsbury's, which seems a bit strange. Justin King, uh, he's not really very skilled in uh, so much as running a motorsport series. Very different to running a supermarket chain. He does have a um, son involved. He has a son involved in motorsport, Jordan King. Um, so there's links there, but. They're a bit loose. Um, do you think anybody from a team could step up to that? And, and also, do you think it's a poison chalice, in effect? No, it's 100% a poison chalice to the extent that uh, I think whoever takes over from uh, Bernie, and obviously it will happen at some day, he's 84 this year, uh, whoever takes over, I think it's inevitable that they're going to want to try and make changes for the sake of stamping their name on uh, Formula One. And it's dangerous to do such a thing because Formula One's business model has been developed, as I said, over about 40 years since Bernie has been in charge. So any slight changes could destabilise the, uh, the entire business. I mean, the most likely uh, change really is that Formula One will be run more by more of a committee. Bernie is, really has um, authority across, currently across, sponsorship, um, whatever marketing Formula One does, the circuits, the TV deals, all of it, hospitality, it's more likely that when he goes there'll be multiple people running uh, each of these divisions with somebody overseeing them and the only person who's really in the frame, because he doesn't have a successor groomed, the only person that, uh, that's really in the frame is the um, uh, the, 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 the chairman, I believe, of Nestle, the food company, who is currently on the board of Formula One. And uh, he's not so much as being groomed as a, as a successor, but he's run, obviously, a big company like uh, Nestle. He would seem, uh, you know, a, a logical choice. Personally, I, you know, I mean, I've, I've said for a long time that the former director general of the BBC, Greg Dyke, I think he would make a, an ideal, and he's now obviously involved with football, he'd make an ideal, uh, uh, you know, somebody who could certainly have a good go at it, because if you can run the BBC, I'm pretty sure you can run Formula One. Who knows? Maybe. Maybe. We've been talking very pessimistically, very negatively about the outcome of the trial. Mm. If it turns around and he's found innocent, what happens then? Can he carry on as normal, do you think, or is it too tarnished now? No, I mean, I think I'm pretty sure that if he, um, if he's found innocent, then he'll continue on as, uh, uh, as he has been doing. He'll join the board back again, so as I said, he stepped down from the board, and uh, I, I don't think that they'll... Uh, I don't think there'll be any issues in terms of his reputation. In fact, it will, you know, kind of exonerate him. As you said at the beginning, we're quite in the early stages of the trial at the moment. What are the next steps? When's the next hearing, for example? The next hearing is next week, so we've got basically about a week's break now. The, the hearings are only taking place, which is potentially a signal, really, as to where the court is thinking. The hearings only take place for two days a week anyway, so because Bernie has been allowed to r run Formula One at the same time. So he was in Barcelona at the weekend? Yes, indeed. So the, um, the courts are already uh, uh, taking some level of leniency, which for him is certainly a good sign. And when will we find out the outcome? <laughs> How long do you think it's going to take? Um, apparently September, but I can easily see it going on until next year. It's long and complicated. And that's a lot of money being spent, isn't it? Yeah, ten, tens of millions of pounds. Um, and as I said, it's interesting that the prosecutors accept that he uh, was blackmailed, and uh, he says he was blackmailed. So, you know, one could argue what's the point of going through all of this exercise, spending all that money when both sides to a large extent are in agreement. Well, I'm sure it will continue rumbling along, alongside the F1 World Championship. We'll be following it very closely here on Pole Position. Christian Silk may well be back to run us through <laughs> a little bit more about what's going on in the court at the moment. Keep an eye on the channel and, of course, subscribe so you don't miss out on anything. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I was measuring the airflow behind the front wheels. And what they're doing is measuring how that airflow comes off. And as we run it forward, you'll see there it comes out of this system of pipework and into what's called an in 